I'm Fonzo. And I'm Aliza. And we're the co-host of Grown, a podcast from the moth that shows we're never fully grown. Growing up feels like a phase that should end at some point, but does it ever really? Whether you're 16 or 26 or 86, you're going to have to deal with family drama, your body, and the type of person you want to be. So why not put it all out in the open and go through it together? Join us every other week to deal with cringe, culture, and the courageous efforts of people like you to get grown. Start listening today. Follow Grown on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Till death do us part. That line has always kind of freaked me out. Yeah, there's the whole committing to someone forever and ever thing. But the scarier part to me is the reminder that no matter what your dreams are for life with another person, the future is unpredictable. At this moment, imagining a future without my partner is hypothetical, but we've both seen up close what it looks like when the hypothetical becomes the reality. When I first met my partner John, his dad was in remission from incurable bile duct cancer. Not too long after we started dating, I crashed his family trip to celebrate his parents' 40th wedding anniversary, and I was struck right away by one thing. His parents dance together every night. This dance was born from a vow they made to each other the night before his dad's first major surgery to make time for a nightly dance for as many nights as they could, picking a new song each time. Not long after that family trip, his dad's cancer came back. Over the next two years, as his parents grappled with unpredictable health swings while still celebrating life, they stayed committed to that nightly dance, a moment of closeness and intimacy in the face of so much unknown. His dad, John Christopher Gardner, passed away in July 2018, and those dances had their own line in his obituary. This is Embodied. I'm Anita Rao. When you know your future with a partner is uncertain, how does that shape how you build and grow your relationship? The the diagnosis really um, threw us for a loop. You know, we uh, we had to reevaluate what our marriage and what our family and what our lives would look like. That's David Pete someone I met about a year ago on the Embodied radio show. He's the husband of Andrea Lytle-Pete. Andrea is a triathlete, a person living with ALS, and the creator of the Team Drea Foundation. Dave and Andrea have a long and winding love story that all started when they were in undergrad. We met um, in a Spanish uh, class at uh, Davidson College um, about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, we have been uh, married for uh, 12 years. Andrea was diagnosed with ALS about five years into their marriage. At that point, Dave and Andrea were living in the D.C. area and were starting to ask some big questions about their future, like when they'd feel ready to have children and whether they'd want to move back to North Carolina to raise them. The diagnosis put a lot of those life plan conversations on the back burner. It, it was very much a, you know, make it through the day, make it through the week, kind of process your your grief and your sadness at the same time of of thinking through what the rest of your life will look like, right? I mean, for for my part, it was uh, it was a lot of thinking about. Try, trying to think about the long term while really in reality trying to get through the short term uh, at the exact same time. I think both of us, you know, just kind of got into the mode of enjoying the time we had with each other um, on a day to day basis, uh, knowing that that might not be uh, much longer. But luckily, here we are seven years later, and she is strong and vibrant and uh, conquering her dreams. It was a temporary hazard, a life um, expectancy of 
uh, to drive five years, and um, it took me almost one uh, to get diagnosed. And so um, when I uh, left uh, the doctor's office, I realized that I really um, uh, uh, just didn't have any more uh, time uh, to waste in uh, this life. I, I realized that, you know, we didn't want uh, to spend our, our remaining time arguing about uh, the, uh, the little things like uh, who was uh, going uh, to do uh, the dishes or something. Coming to terms with Andrea's diagnosis has meant accepting that their future as a couple won't look the way they initially planned. For both of them, it's been important to make space for this grief without letting it stop them from enjoying their time together. I remember that um, at the end of uh, the day, um, our hugs were a little uh, tighter and, you know, the uh, I love you um, meant a lot more. We knew from the outset from diagnosis that grief this profound grief would be a part of our lives for a long time and and we would kind of continue to process it in some ways still are processing it today. We allowed each other room to talk about that grief and talk about the 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 emptiness that we felt and kind of just let it in, right? I mean we you know the, the only other people that we knew at the time of diagnosis that were going through what we were going through was each other. And we needed to be able to to talk about what we felt like we were losing and how much that hurt um, to also be able to appreciate what we still had. You know, we, we gave each other space to to talk about what life was going to look like and, and how that, that wasn't like what we had envisioned in our five-year plans. They were the only people they knew going through this, which meant deciding how and when to disclose Andrea's diagnosis to others was complicated. Over the years, they've been able to build a supportive community around them and have found that most people are able to empathize in some way with their situation, even if at first they aren't quite sure how to respond. I uh, put my... A story out there uh, pretty early um, on my uh, blog and on uh, social media. And then I, um, I just uh, felt um, so much love uh, from my uh, friends and uh, family who uh, wanted uh, really to uh, help us and um, wanted to uh, hold a space for uh, whatever uh, we wanted to uh, talk about. And so uh, that has really helped us. You know, I think, I think in, in my case, I, I, I just kind of went in with eyes open that they probably wouldn't understand what the disease was. Um, you know, they, a lot of the people who we would talk to, whether they were friends or family would, you know, they remember Andrea from when her speech wasn't slurred or, you know, when she was sprinting on a race course or riding a bike or running a marathon. And, you know, people want to ask what's wrong, but sometimes they want, they, you know, don't want to be impolite or they don't want to make her feel uncomfortable or something. Um, you know, people in general, I think, are sensitive creatures and know how to know generally how to empathize. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that's, that's hard for people to misunderstand just as I, I think I could empathize with folks who have had cancer or another condition that I don't have personal experience with. ALS is a progressive disease, which means Andrea will experience an increasing number of limitations over time. But intimacy and touch are still an important part of Dave and Andrea's relationship in large part because they've allowed their definition of intimacy to evolve along with Andrea's limitations and needs. We uh, lean in uh, to the physical 
uh, touch that we have, and um, we, uh, you know, uh, sit together on uh, uh, the couch um, instead of over, and um, we uh, hold hands, um, and we just um, appreciate uh, that we have uh, this time, and um, that feels like more intimate than, um, you know, just like uh, being out in the world, like we are in intentional uh, with each other. Yeah, it's, you know, uh, uh, when she needs her toes to be stretched or her fingers to be stretched or or something like that, you know, it's it's it, it's not the first thing that probably most couples think of um, uh, as far as as far as intimacy, but, um, but it makes a big difference to her. And I, and I think it's, it's a, it, it, it's a unique way that we can kind of take care of each other and, and, and something that's certainly changed since diagnosis. Definitely. I uh, get the best uh, back scratches. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good, that's a good skill, a good back rub, a good back scratch. There's really nothing better than that. <laughs> As your physical needs change, Andrea, how have you kind of practiced communicating that? Do you prefer to be the one that says like, hey, this is this is what I need. This is how you can help me. Or are there ways that you've all kind of figured out how to intuit what the other needs like? And does that change over time? So I, I think uh, the biggest um, argument uh, we have uh it's about uh, my uh, driving. Um, I, I, I think I'm a, a really a good uh, driver, and I, I uh, pass um, like, uh, like a uh, driving test every year. Uh, but you know, uh, David uh, doesn't want uh, to be the one um, uh, to. Uh, uh, take away uh, my keys, and I appreciate that. And um, so I'm really uh, trying to uh, be honest uh, with myself. I start driving uh, before I I get too tired. I um, I try not to drive in like um um. Uh, um a traffic or whatever, and um, I just need to be um, careful and honest. I'll back away from, you know, engaging in the fight that Andrea raised on. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Unless you're really wanting to <laughs> increase your ratings. Um, I think um, you know, we've always been fairly good communicators, and I, I think I, I think the fact that that I'm around her all the time allows me to kind of generally intuit what she might need when, uh, particularly being sensitive to the fact that, that Andrea does not like over helpers. Um, mm-hmm. you know, if there is something that she can do physically, uh, you know, she does not want me to, you know, bubble wrap her as she's, as she's walking with the walker, uh, or, or out in the scooter, um, uh, you know, in, in public or something like that, uh, as much as, as much as that might be the safest and most careful possible option, it's, it's about understanding, um, not only what she's saying she needs and, and letting her be the one to, to kind of lead, uh, but, but also being comfortable with that middle ground that even if she's not asking for it, yeah, there might be a fall or yeah, there might be a close call. And if there is, um, you know, being there as quickly as possible to, to make sure that she's taken care of. Um, so it's, you know, in some ways it's been about, it, it, it's been about not, not acting on my immediate instinct to just try to keep her safe all the time, but being comfortable with that middle ground of, um, uh, that there might be bumps and bruises, but, um, but living and being comfortable with those bumps and bruises happening. Getting comfy with the middle ground and letting your partner take the lead even when you're afraid, 
it's not easy. I introduced you to my partner, John, earlier on this show. And around the time that his dad's health started to decline again, he was actually diagnosed with some inner ear issues that really disrupt his balance. It's meant that driving at night isn't always a safe idea. And I'm often at war with myself about how much to voice my fears and how much to trust that he's making safe decisions for his body. This process of growing comfortable with change while also centering independence, autonomy, and joy in their time together has been the latest chapter in Dave and Andrea's love story. As of the release of this episode, this chapter is one they're still writing together. Andrea has continued to rack up marathons while Dave cheers for her from the sidelines. As of April 2022, Andrea has completed 49 races, bringing her closer to her goal of completing one marathon in each of the 50 states. Andrea and David were more than a decade deep into their relationship before her diagnosis. But not everyone who navigates romance and terminal illness does so in the context of long-term partnership. 20, you're supposed to have your whole life ahead of you. Not think about how your life's going to end. Meet Megan Yeager. Megan is in her mid-20s and is a blogger, a contributing writer for TheMighty.com, and an aspiring photographer. Megan was diagnosed with a connective tissue disease when she was 20. At that time, her doctor told her to enjoy the time she had left. Something inside me snapped that day, but it made me realize just how valuable life is. And gratefully, we found a treatment that made it so I could eat. We found that treatment by accident, and that treatment led to a diagnosis. But I promised myself since then to just consider every year after 20 a bonus year and just make the best out of whatever time I have. So now, I mean, things aren't as, I guess, imminently dire as you thought they were at that point, but you are kind of, you acknowledge that um, you may not have as much time um, as you would want. You have a number of chronic and life-threatening illnesses. I'm curious about, I guess, how you think about dating and romance, kind of given what you know about your body and health. So to be completely honest, it has made me the world's biggest committophobic mm. <laughs> because like most people, they're looking towards that future. Someone they're going to be old grandparents with sitting on a porch. And with my help, I can't really guarantee you I'll be here with like a year from now. So just balancing it, that all is kind of, well, it's super difficult because you don't want to be on a first date and be like, well, I'm kind of a limited time offer, so enjoy me while you have me, you know? <laughs> Megan wrote an essay for TheMighty.com about her process of making a dating profile, and it made me laugh out loud. She writes, quote, I decided to write the most honest thing I can on my dating profile. Limited time offer. Date with outgoing 6-1 girl. Take her out before her rare life-threatening autoimmune disease does. Clearly, she has a sense of humor and a desire to be transparent. Figuring out the balance between both of those has meant her approach to disclosure has evolved over time. It's changed a little bit with the pandemic because I'm now on oxygen. So you can't exactly hide that you're sick when you have a cannula dinging out of your nose. But <laughs> I kind of just like kind of low key tell them that I have some health issues so I may not want to be the kind of girl you take hiking. And I don't really mention the part that I could end up in the emergency room if they took me hiking. Mm. <laughs> and then it's when I see like potential in the person because your illness is not it's a big part of you, but it's not who you are. And you owe it to yourself and the person you're getting to know to let them actually get to know you before that roadblock is put in the way. I'd love to know about kind of the best reaction that you have had. Have there been any um, any potential first dates or, or second dates where things um, have gone really well, a uh, reaction that you felt really supported by? I think the best would probably be I actually had an online date and the guy was going to take me country swing dancing, which probably would have led to my death. Mm. But I'm an extremely outgoing person and I've always wanted to try it. So I'm like, oh, maybe, you know, a couple of days unable to walk is going to be worth it. Like, it'll be fine, you know? 
<laughs> he all of a sudden out of nowhere told me that uh, he changed the whole date idea. And it was like this super accessible date. Like we went to dinner and a movie and just like sat at a park and talked and it was super fun. And then all of a sudden he said something about my health. I'm like, how do you know that? And he's like, I may have Facebook. (laughs) You had cancer. I'm like, and he's like, and some other things that I didn't want you to get sick on the date. So I changed it. (laughs) Like I admired it so much that he still wanted to get to know me for me, even when he got like a context I didn't even give him about my health. One of Megan's biggest pet peeves is when people treat her like she's fragile just because her health is. Pity is a surefire way to ruin the mood. So when Megan gets a sense that a date has begun feeling sorry for her, she relies on that sense of humor as a way to redirect. So humor is probably like my number one coping mechanism. Like my lungs are really bad and I always cough. Whenever a guy gives me a funny look on a date when I cough, I tell him it's my mating call. Oh my god. Or like I'll be limping and they'll give me a sad look and I'll be like, hey, that's my sexy limp. That's just for you. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's that's amazing. (laughs) You're just like thinking on your feet, you know, turn everything into into a sexy way to to move the conversation forward. (laughs) Exactly. Well, I've learned when it comes to your health. It's a lot harder to be pitied when you don't pity yourself. Mm. People catch on to that. Like if you're kind of a woe is me person, so are the people around you. But if you take it in stride, even if you have to fake it that day, like it makes a difference. There are plenty of Hollywood takes on navigating romance with a terminal illness. I recently watched The Fault in Our Stars on an airplane and it took me out for a solid day. There's a lot of heaviness in there but plenty of beauty, too. For Megan, there's a lot about these stories of other young folks that ring true to her own experience. Most importantly, that the search for companionship does indeed happen at the treatment center, even if the result is less dignified than what we see on screen. When you're at, like, appointments or infusion centers, you kind of hunt for someone who's super hot and in a chair too. (laughs) Like I had a surgery on my hip, so I was in a red walker. I could barely walk. They removed this tumor. It's like the size of a potato, but I heard the guy next to me was six, four and I'm six, one. Wow. So I got out of my chair and I like hit my IV pole, like a battering ram with my walker and pretended I had to go use the bathroom so I could go ring check the guy next to me. (laughs) (laughs) And what happened? (laughs) He was super married. Ugh. All of a sudden, I see the ring on his finger, and he's talking about his wife. And I'm like, okay, that was a waste. I could be, like, watching The Office right now instead of sweating to death in pain because I wanted to ring check a guy. <laughs> Unlike Dave and Andrea, Megan isn't doing the emotional processing around her diagnosis with a romantic partner. At least not now. Her support system, which is made up of family and friends— comes with its own unique challenges. But it's been no less important for Megan to speak with others about what she's going through. That's another thing I've been kind of working on because I got diagnosed with an immune deficiency in the middle of a pandemic. Mm. So all that stuff became a little more real, you know? (laughs) And it's like, it's really hard to bring it up. Like right now, it's still kind of a joke. But I've had to come to the point where like, just for my own mental health, I've had to talk with friends and family and kind of get them to acknowledge that truth along with me. Because no one wants to think about your like 25-year-old friend or sister or daughter dying. But in my life, it's a really real reality. And it's something that's hard to process. And I've learned that it's something that you can't process by yourself. Like You have to allow yourself that support system. Hmm. You mentioned the experience of the pandemic, and obviously it's been challenging in a lot of ways. Um, Scary, I'm sure, for you, given that you already have compromised immunity. Is there anything that you, I guess, have learned from this, all of this personal time or more alone time um, that you want to take forward into dating? Anything that you've uncovered about yourself or um, about what you would want for your future? 
my illness has always been invisible and for years I lied about it. Mm. So I kind of used that lie like as a super crutch and a coping, me- like coping mechanism to hide stuff. And now my illness just kind of lays right under my nose. But I've realized it's made me more open about my health when it comes to like online dating or people in my life. And I've realized that even though my health makes me feel broken and maybe like I wouldn't be a good partner for someone, that again, we all have broken pieces, but it's those broken pieces that can be turned into a mosaic and make something beautiful. Like the hard things in our life, they don't define us but they do refine us. And the things I've learned through my illness are things that would make me a great girlfriend or wife or mom someday. We checked back in with Megan to see how things were going since we spoke with her last June. She said, with humor-laden emojis, there's nothing new on the dating front at the moment. She's on an oral chemo that makes her extra immune suppressed. So getting out there in the pandemic has not been easy. But as post-COVID life hopefully normalizes and her health stabilizes a bit, she hopes things will change. Megan, Andrea, and Dave are all figuring out in real time what it means to build and foster connection in the face of terminal illness. And I'm going to leave you now with some of their advice for others who are in a similar situation. I would say... um uh, the, uh, your uh, story isn't when um, you are uh, uh, unique and um, uh, stay ahead of uh, the uh, disease, uh, but uh, make plans to um, trauma and uh, to do uh, what you love, uh, to do uh, what you can and um, to uh, make those happy memories um, for the future uh, for your partner. You really are in it together and you need to uh, do everything you possibly can to communicate both your struggles and your triumphs so that you can continue to work together to live with the disease. It's important to know that you are enough. And even with your health situation, you're not too much for someone. Like everyone has baggage. And just because yours is a bit more financially expensive and a bit more obvious, it doesn't make you any less worthy of finding a companion. Embodied is a production of North Carolina Public Radio WUNC, a listener-supported station. If you want to lend your support to this podcast and WUNC's other shows on demand, consider a contribution at wunc.org now. Incredible storytelling like you hear on Embodied is only possible because of listeners like you. This episode was produced by Kaya Finlay and Audrey Smith. Jenny Lawson is our sound engineer, and Quilla wrote our theme music. The show is supported by Weaver Street Market, a worker and consumer-owned cooperative selling organic and local food at four triangle locations in North Carolina. Now featuring online shopping with next day pickup. WeaverStreetMarket.coop. And if you enjoy this show, please share about us on social media or write us a review. It helps new folks find our show, and it means so much. Until next time, I'm Anita Rao, taking on the taboo with you.